Um, as I answered the, uh, on the written answers, as it depend, I think it really depends on the system. Um, some systems have mechanics that are um, that almost require you to manage your uh, hero system. Um, well, not so much the well, hero system in particular. Champions, um, champions is meant to be played with miniatures. Um, even though it's a role playing game, it, it, the combat is meant to be handled with miniatures. Um, the do I think it helps or hinders? It really depends. Um, I've used miniatures. I've not used miniatures. Um, some people are. Uh, I think you really got to know your players. Um, it helps some people to have miniatures out there to to envision things. As I should say, not envision, but uh, visualize it. Um, but it can hinder. Um, D and D doesn't need miniatures. Um, that was one of when, we, when you asked the questions about the the additions. That was one of the things I did I disliked dramatically um, for a third in, th in three five and and even Pathfinder um, is its its dependency on on miniatures um, to the point where in three five I think they even define spell effects by uh, you know how many squares or whatever it affected uh, or something like that. Um, I just I I don't. Because it, it, it started shifting the focus, and that's where they can be a hindrance. When they shift the focus from the character to to a board game, then they're a hindrance. Um, you know, when if the, and, and you know we've brought this up in my game a couple of times when I've had new players come in, ask, well, you know, how I need I need to see the grid so I know how far that is to that to that monster. If you were playing the character, that character does not have a laser grid that he puts down that he can see where to target the perfectly placed his spell. Take your chance, you know, like like you would take. So it can take away from it. Um, now, that doesn't mean you have to use a gridded board with miniatures. You can just put. Oh, we've done this. We've done it where we had miniatures just sitting on the tabletop so people could see the uh, the the figs and have a general idea where things were. Um, uh, so if you have players that tend to fixate on, on, on the grid, take the grid away. Um, you don't need it. Now, again, though, it, it depends on the system. Um, I, you know, champions. Can you play champions without the hex map? Yes, I've done it. It's not as an effective game because some of the inherent mechanics really, really do require that, that hex grid. Um, but it, it doesn't mean it can't be done without it. Um, but it's a different setting. It's a different type of game. Um, you're recreating comic books. It's a, it's a little different than like say D and D. Or uh, so. Uh, do I think they help or hinder both? Um, they they can be help. They're also cool. Everybody also likes you know. There's something tactile about having, a, you know, especially a custom fig in in, in front of you. Uh, you know, Terry, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in, in the game in, in my campaign right now, he is a dwarf. The, a paladin's carrying a scythe, and we found a dwarven miniature with a scythe, so he bought it. <laughs> you know, because that's not exactly the most common thing in the world. And he was able to find one with a miniature carrying a scythe, so he was all about it. Um, so it, yeah, it can be kind of cool to have you know your custom fig and uh, out there, but or in front of you to represent it. But it doesn't. It is a I think it's just. Uh, it's just a tool or an accessory or like anything else, you know. You can use it to or it can help or hinder based on the player. Uh, I agree, um, almost wholeheartedly. And the way the use of miniatures kind of comes in, even though you know we're playing three five and we're playing D and D, no, they're not required. And we don't always use them uh, in town, for example. You know, if everyone's just walking about town, intermingling with different people, you don't have to be on the map intermingling with these people doing these things. Uh, it just kind of provides a little bit of structure, I suppose, in regards to combat situations. And in regards to the metagame aspect, I do see it happen, and you do have to deal with it. I think this goes back to control and power as a GM in your game. Um, if you see characters who obviously can't see through three walls all of a sudden want to rush across the room to the treasure chest in the completely different room that their companion's in, you as an individual kind of have to step in and put them back in their place and remember that what they see isn't what their character sees. So some boundaries need to be established in order for this to work. 
and incorporating it into a game uh, such as D&D uh, in combat situations, not always in town situations, on and off, I think provides a balance for those players. Certain individuals who like it more get their time, but other players who don't want to focus so much on it have their time in town as well. So here I think it goes back to a little bit of balance. Um, and for me, what you see isn't always what you get. A lot of times uh, I use the miniatures strictly for threat assessment purposes. Uh, instead of just saying you see a large black dragon, uh, putting a black dragon that's physically this big beside a miniature that's this big all of a sudden puts it you know, into perspective for them so they can make better decisions as a party as a whole. I love my miniatures. This is my stance as a New Age gamer. Um, and here's why. I don't necessarily think they're always a great thing. I really do think that mini miniatures can kind of tear your game apart at points because you lose that aspect of visualization on what this person sees. But when I started playing uh, in back in the days, we didn't have any of these type of things. We didn't have a game mat. We didn't have miniatures. We didn't have any of that. And a lot of the details got lost. And that sense that you're trying to focus on one thing, so you put all of your effort and concentration into that thing, while other things are lost. One turn you might be 60 feet away from the character, but after six other people, all of a sudden the dungeon master has had a brain fart and you're 20 feet away from this character. You're like, oh, I thought it was this. So in that sense, you really have to have the aptitude as a game master to have some control, to pay attention to those small details. For your players, I think it goes both ways. I think that some players actually get a boost in imagination from that visualization. This is what my character could be, but I want him to have black hair. But he's got a long bow instead of a short bow. He carries two daggers and wears a black cloak. So in that sense, it gives them a nice little structure to build around. Um, also in combat, it provides more of a strategy aspect to things. Instead of just saying, I run behind it. You have to literally find a path around the trees to literally get behind that enemy to provide a flanking bonus. So I think that miniatures and map play and everything is very, very helpful, uh, especially for new age gamers uh, who are coming from a little bit of a younger background. They're used to the visual elements of things. Um, so it helps them put themselves in the realm uh, of your RPG. And a good example of this is my 18-year-old player again. He is not traditionally a gamer, he's not traditionally a reader, um, he's more of an outdoorsman type. But when he came into the game, one of the things he said was, you know, I want to make a dwarf, and I have this picture in my mind of what he's going to look like. And I had a dwarf sitting on the table, uh, a miniature, and who was holding a big, large tower shield, and the tower shield in his armor was all blue. And he's like, this isn't it. This isn't it. The way I picture him, he's got silver armor, and he's got a two-handed axe. So I was like, all right, maybe we can help you out. So we go look at the other dwarven miniatures, and he finds something. He's like, boom, that's it right there. I want him to have silver armor and gold plate, just like this guy has. So in that sense, he did a little bit of both. He brought his own concept and took that concept from the miniature and combined them to create his own character. Yeah, so essentially said the same thing. <laughs> Just use different words to say the same thing. I mean, and and, and it's true. I, it, that's a different. I think that's a that's a it's a different topic though. It gets into another topic, and that's with the, um, with what new players would expect coming into a you know into a game. I remember I picked up. I think it was uh, I think it was V three of Cyberpunk. I look at the rules because I know Cyberpunk. I, I played I played Cyberpunk. I played Cyberpunk 2020. So I'm like, I know the rules. So I picked the book to start flipping through the book. And I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> Where's Cyberpunk? This isn't what the what the hell. And then I'm going back to the front of the book. I read a forward, you know, and and Talsorian's forward, and that it got to the point of why the book was set up the way it was. And it said straight out, um, you know, and I'm paraphrasing. But it said, you know, essentially said, if you're looking for, it, it, you're probably reading this wondering what happened to my cyberpunk. Don't worry, it's here. Um, you know, it, he explains that 
to appeal to new players who are being essentially cutting their teeth not on role playing games um, or they're cutting their teeth on video games and stuff growing up. So you're appealing to that market. You're trying to get those players. So you need something that has visceral impact now. Um, because that's what they expect. That's what you get in the video game. So when you're attracting that kind of player, so the. But he also still included the stuff that you know the the veteran players or people who've been playing for a long time, um, you know, were looking for, and it was there. It was just in the back of the book, um, and then, then he went on the, to as far as how they integrated and all that, and uh, but. So I think that's a different element, and, and miniatures come, do play can play a big part of that. If you're used to playing uh, video games, if you're used to playing you know, Skyrim and uh, and and the like, to go play D and D sitting around a table with just some paper in front of you and a pencil might be a little uh, you know a little bit of a culture shock. Um, but then again, you did sit down to play it, so you, you, part of that is the willingness to do it. Um, it's a, you know, you're going, you're trying something different, but yeah, miniatures can help in the, in that aspect. But again, also they, in the same thing, they can hinder too, because they can slow that, uh, that step into a, a, a different type of game. You know, when I got to, when I'm playing one game, I don't, and I go to play something else, uh, you know, sitting here looking at legendary dungeon on there. If I'm sitting down to play legendary and then I go to play dungeon afterward, I don't expect to see Captain America running around the dungeon. You know, I, I just accept that it's a different game. It has its own mechanics and etc. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for the cards that are legendary to be able to buy and power my guy up. Um, and that's that's part of it. You should just be able to accept the game. And you know, that kind of goes in with some of the stuff we talked about in the beginning of this. Um, it, you should just be able to accept the system you're going in the you're sitting and play. Um, if it uses miniatures, great. If it doesn't use miniatures, great. Um, but it, again, it's like anything. It can, it, yes, it can hinder, but it can help. It just all depends on how you use it.